we're starting to catch small glimpses of a post-COVID world, and it's essential that we now ask ourselves what role the United States will have on the world stage moving forward. Following our withdrawal after nearly a century of U.S. global leadership, the chaos of last year and the events in our nation's capital on January 6, does the international community still save a seat for us at the head table? If we are indeed in the early stages of shifting power dynamics, what exactly comes next? Good evening and welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. I'm Liz Brailsford, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. Our program tonight features Dr. James Lindsay of the Council on Foreign Relations, joined in conversations, conversation by Ryan Sanders of the Dallas Morning News. This program is part of the 2021 International Perspective Series, which the Council has been hosting in partnership with the American Jewish Committee of Dallas for over 20 years, identifying critical issues in U.S. foreign policy and bringing them home to North Texas. The Council is incredibly grateful for all of its supporters. The 2021 International Perspective Series is generously sponsored by our friends at Haynes and Boone. Special thanks to Council Board Member Larry Paschal for your continued leadership and support of our mission. We have a full schedule of virtual events, so remember to check out our web website at dfwworld.org for newly scheduled events. Now I'd like to welcome Regional Director of AJC Dallas, Joel Schweitzer, to say a few words. Joel, thank you for your continued partnership and support of this series, and I look forward to what our two organizations will still uh, continue to ac accomplish together. Thanks to everybody for being here, and Joel, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, everyone, for coming this evening, and thank you, of course, to Haynes and Boone for your generous support of this, uh, of this series. Um, one of the things that makes the partnership between AJC and the World Affairs Council such a natural is our role, our unique role in the Jewish community as the State Department of the Jewish people and the diplomatic arm of the Jewish community. I'd like to invite everyone here to join us to see some of that in action during our 2021 virtual global forum, which will be taking place from June 6th through 9th. You can get more information by going to ajc.org slash global forum. We're excited that this year we've already confirmed four presidents from various countries. We will have at least one foreign minister from the Arab world. Uh, AJC has been uh, doing a lot of advocacy in the Gulf states for over 25 years. In fact, IPS chair Ray Termini has been to uh, has been to the Gulf States with AJC on one of those diplomatic missions, and I'm sure he'd love to tell you about it at some point if you ask him. Uh, we will also be making a special announcement during Global Forum about our, uh, our office that will be opening in Abu Dhabi, and, uh, and we'll be finally celebrating the 50th anniversary of our Jacob Blaustein Institute for Human Rights. So it'll be a very packed few days. We hope that you will join us for some or all of it. Uh, and when you go to that ajc.org slash global forum page, you can see some of the programs that, uh, that took place last year in the virtual space, including a conversation with the foreign minister of the UAE, Anwar Gargash, uh, and, uh, and an address by Secretary of State, then Secretary of State, I should say, Mike Pompeo, who we had the pleasure of seeing uh, just a few days ago uh, through our friends and partners at the World Affairs Council. Uh, so it's a very full docket. We hope you'll participate and, and join. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Larry Pascal to introduce our speaker and moderator. Thank you, Joel. Our guest today is one of the leading authorities on American foreign policy and a good friend of our council, Dr. James Lindsay. Dr. Lindsay has served, as, has served as the Senior Vice President, Director of Studies, and the Maurice R. Greenberg Chair at the Council of Foreign Relations since 2003. He also has close ties to the state of Texas, having served as the inaugural director of the Robert S. Strauss Center for, Ameri for International Security and Law 
and the Tom Slick Chair for International Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin's LBJ School of Public Affairs. Dr. Lindsay previously served on the staff of the, of the National Security Council as a consultant to the U.S. Commission on National Security and as a sta staff expert on the task force for the United States Institute of Peace to the United Nations. He has also worked in various government and research positions on international affairs at the University of Iowa, the Brookings Institution, and Harvard University. Fitting for a man of his distinction, Dr. Lindsay has also written widely on various aspects of American foreign policy and international relations. His most recent book, co-authored with Ivo Dalder, is entitled The Empty Throne, America's Abdication of Global Leadership. Additionally, he discusses the politics of American foreign policy and the domestic underpinnings of American global power in podcasts and on his blog, the, Water, the Water's Edge, available on the CFR website. Joining us to moderate this conversation is Ryan Sanders, editorial writer for the Dallas Morning News. Ryan's writing has been recognized for community journalism, fiction, and public relations, and he serves as a community pastor at the Irving Bible Church. I know we were in for a fascinating conversation, and with that, take it away, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Larry, and uh, thank you uh, all for, for being here and joining us. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay, for doing this. Uh, as we were saying at the beginning, we only wish that we could do this in person so you could dodge these Texas thunderstorms along with us. But uh, thank you for joining us via Zoom. I want to jump uh, just right into some questions. I have a whole lot of them for you, so I'll just pepper you. Uh, but I thought it might be good to start with sort of a broad kind of question. One of the things that I noticed about what I've read from you is that you, um, one of the things that you do well is sort of set American foreign policy in the context of history. Um, even in your latest book where you sort of talk about the isolationist uh, views of George Washington, and then tracing that to, to Donald Trump, and then the sort of the rise and fall of the rules-based order in between there. So uh, I know I'm sort of asking you to compress 200 years of American foreign policy history in three minutes, but if you could sort of do that for this audience and um, set trace those things for us to set us uh, up for where we are now, and then we can ask about what's next. Okay, Ryan, I will try to do that. Uh, first, let me say thank you to our host. I want to say thank you to the AGC of Dallas and the World Affairs Council of Dallas for inviting me to come speak. I really do wish I could come down to Texas and see all of you in person. I've always enjoyed my uh, travels to Dallas. I wanna thank Larry Pascal and uh, Haynes Boone for sponsoring this series. It's a very impressive group of people uh, you have, uh, have come and speak. I feel honored to be included among the list. Uh, so thank you very much and Ryan, thank you uh, very much for agreeing to ask me questions. And I will try to keep my answers short. As uh, Larry said in that overly generous introduction, uh, I'm an academic by training, which means we can give very long answers. But I'll try to give shorter answers than you can, uh, being a journalist, follow up and ask me questions. I guess I'd say if you look at the history of American foreign policy, at particular periods of time, the United States has made major choices that have had a tremendous impact on its security and prosperity. And I'll just single out a couple of them. You mentioned George Washington. If you were to go back to the 1790s, it was a time in which politics were much more poisonous and partisan than they are even today. It was a time when the so-called Republicans, which later became the party known as the Democrats, sorry to be confusing, and the so-called Federalists really squared off about uh, the nature of what America would be and what its relations to the rest of the world would be. George Washington, who uh, sided with the Federalists, perhaps the most famous of being Alexander Hamilton, gave his farewell address uh, to the American people, it was actually written, and he laid out what became known as uh, Washington's great rule of conduct, that the United States, in essence, should have economic and political relations with other countries, but avoid uh, alliances with them, what Thomas Jefferson would subsequently call entangling alliances. And that decision, uh, one which was resisted by people like Thomas Jefferson, uh, because they favored siding with France at the time, which was going through its revolution, uh, really laid the groundwork for 
a very long period of American security and prosperity really created the space uh, to allow the United States to grow. If you go flash forward to 1941, uh, a journalist named Henry Luce wrote an essay in Life magazine in which he coined the term American century, from which the title of this talk is made. His argument was that the United States had, after World War I, made the wrong choice, that it had withdrawn from the world, and as a consequence of having withdrawn from the world, it had ushered in a period of great instability and great threat uh, to the American way of life. And his argument, uh, which he laid out in the pages again of Life magazine, was that the United States, because it was a great power, had the ability to shape its environment. That great power to the United States certainly was one, isn't just a cork in the current of history. And that what the United States needed to do is to lead. And what we saw over the subsequent 80 years was a great deal of American leadership. We call it the rules-based or liberal international order, but it really was an American-led world order. Well, now here it is in 2021, and I think we face a similar inflection point, question of making the choices about uh, what kind of world the United States uh, is living in and choices about how to adapt to that world. Uh, what worked uh, perhaps very well in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s uh, may not be the answer today. And the question is, how do you chart a secure and prosperous course in what is a troubling world? Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and, and to drill down even more on that idea of the rules-based order, uh, you have talked about that being sort of formed around three values, um, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And I wonder if you could give us, um, it, it seems to me that all three of those values are flagging right now. How would you assess those three, democracy, human rights, and rule of law in the moment, this inflection moment that we're in now? Well, I think in the inflection moment you have right now, there are really sort of two important things. One, obviously, is the rise of China. Now, we can argue about whether China presents an authoritarian model for the rest of the world to copy or not. I don't subscribe to that school of thought. But whether you would believe that or not, the important thing is that China wants to remake the rules of the road in international affairs to make them favor Chinese interests, Chinese values. Chinese security. And those decisions are not going to be friendly to American interests and values uh, in security. The flip side, I think, of course, is in many ways the United States has really lost its way. I think many people in the audience have heard of a gentleman named George Kennan. George Kennan, uh, back in 1947, wrote an article published in Foreign Affairs. Foreign Affairs is a publication of the Council on Foreign Relations. It's a so-called Mr. X article, and he talked about the sources of Soviet conduct. And then he laid out what became known as the policy of containment, the policy that really guided American foreign policy from the late 1940s until uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. And Kennan, who was a very smart guy, wrote something very interesting. What he argued was that for the United States ultimately to succeed, would depend upon the peoples of the world getting the impression that the United States was a country that knows what it wants, that is coping with the problems of its internal life, and is comfortable with the responsibilities of a world power. And I think on those latter, well, actually all three dimensions, the United States today is struggling. We are unsure of our role in the world. I think there's a fair amount of pessimism about whether American power is sustainable, whether we are in decline. Uh, I think obviously, uh, if you look around the United States, there's a great deal of partisanship and division. Again, not unprecedented in American history, but certainly unprecedented for us in terms of our lifespan, nothing quite like it, which is really sort of shaking confidence in the United States, both at home and abroad. And I think what that sets up is an inflection point it's a sort of a period in time in which the choices we make today, because things are so fluid, are going to have significant long-term impacts. And the question is, will we choose wisely for the context in which we live or badly? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to get to China. Uh, you, 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 we went there briefly, but before we do that, 
I think you raised an important point that I wanted to ask about. Uh, in, in President Biden's speech uh, just, you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, he, he talked about what he's hearing from other world leaders. And I want to ask you if you're hearing this and how to answer it. He said that um, in my conversations with world leaders, I've, I've made it known that America is back. And you know what they say? The comment I hear most of them say is, we see America is back, but for how long? Are you hearing that? And do you, are our allies, do our allies have America on this sort of every four years renewal plan just to see if we're going to be back, you know, continually? Or, you know, 74 million people voted for the um, disruption that you just described. Um, can our allies, what, al what assurances can we give them that, we're not entering a generations long period of isolation. So yeah, take that question that Biden presented. Well, that, that's a great question, Ryan. I, I do want to uh, sort of make one clarification. While 74 million people voted for the man who brought the disruption, it's not necessarily the case that 74 million people voted for the disruption. Uh, it's impossible. It's possible to vote for President Trump and disagree with him on, on specific uh, positions. And I'll let a lot of Republicans uh, certainly in the United States Congress, opposed what President Trump wanted to do, for example, on Russia, on cutting the State Department life. But let's sort of put that sort of issue aside. You're quite right. It is quite visible that many countries worry about two things with the United States. One, the sustainability of American power. And second, the reliability of American power. And both of those perceptions are very hard to correct. What's the old saying? You don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Well, if you look out for a lot of people around the world, uh, relatively young, what they have seen is not the, the United States that was able to win World War II and defeat the Soviet Union that seemed to uh, intimidate the rest of the world with its confidence, the world of John F. Kennedy that said, we will put a man on the moon in 10 years and then did it. What they see is a country that invaded Iraq and touched off a ruinous civil war. They see a country whose financial dealings triggered the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, uh, which nearly brought down the entire global financial system. They see a country that suddenly turned on its friends, partners, and allies in a country that most notably botched its response to the pandemic and then had January 6th. And so those are sort of uh, debits, if you want to put it uh, in sort of business terms in, in the sort of uh, portfolio for the United States, and it's hard to overcome that. And you see this in public opinion polling. Uh, the European Council on Foreign Relations, which is no relation to the Council on Foreign Relations, did a substantial amount of polling uh, throughout Europe. Its report was released uh, early, earlier this month. And the conclusion is that many European publics are quite skeptical that the United States will be there with them five years, six years down the road. And if the United States is not going to be there with them, the question is, why would you want to hook your wagon? Uh, to that horse. And so that's a real problem that the Biden administration faces. And I think the president with his comment indicated that he understands that very well. Yeah, the way that you said that in your book is, I, the, the quote here is, the number of people who grew up in the shadow of World War II and during the Cold War is shrinking. Instead, more and more people around the world know the United States as the country that invaded Iraq, waterboarded prisoners, nearly wrecked the global economy with subprime mortgages, and turned hostile toward immigrants and refugees. Um, well, now we have the pandemic response and we have January 6th. And again, to the extent the Biden administration wants to be a beacon of liberty, uh, I think it's hard to look at sort of the current health of American democracy and come away thinking that that's our, our best calling card at this moment. The image that's now being shared on the screen, I think, has been seared in many people's minds and it shook confidence, not just here at home, but abroad. So I think that brings us maybe to the, the big question or the question that's in the title of, the, of our call tonight, which is, what do we do with that? I mean, do we, is this a PR campaign to tell the stories of uh, the, what is, in, I won't put words in your mouth, but in my opinion, the, the most um, successful and freedom promoting democratic experiment in human history? Or is it, we're starting now and we got to start making better decisions. It's about from where we go from here. How, what do we, where do we go next? 
Well, in some sense, uh, Ryan, it's both. You don't get to operate with a blank slate. Uh, you are constrained by the history uh, that you have lived in, you have inherited. But obviously, decisions that we make are going to have important consequences. And they're going to have particularly important consequences because now we're really living in a time of change. We're seeing the rise of a competing superpower. We haven't seen that in more than three decades. We're in a time of, uh, in which globalization has brought us closer together and we're discovering through th things like the pandemic that being closer together creates risks we hadn't anticipated. Again, if you think of sort of the way we structured our economy with supply chains in which we could have just-in-time delivery, that worked really well, very, very efficient, allowed you to cut costs, but all of a sudden, when there was a shock to the system, you discovered that it was really difficult to be able to make your economy operate. So there have been a lot of shocks, and we're going to have to sort of work that way through. What I would argue to you, uh, Ryan, is that as you look at sort of the options for the United States, you're actually in a reasonably good place. Uh, the United States has a very strong economy. It has a very dynamic and diverse people. Despite the fact that many people are concerned about choices we've made over the last five years or last 15 or 20 years, the fact is democracy is still popular. The American brand, while tarnished, is still strong. So there's, a, there's the potential to do things. But obviously, to be able to rebuild trust, to be able to re-engage those countries that President Biden spoke about, you're going to have to put out a vision and then back that vision up with deed. And of course, that's a lot easier to sketch than it is actually to do as President Biden, who hopes to do that, is discovering firsthand. Just take the response to the pandemic, trying to measure, match a desire uh, to provide vaccines here at home to Americans so he can be seen as tackling what he said rightly, in my opinion, is job one, getting COVID under control. But by doing so, not doing a lot for countries overseas, being criticized for that, and actually having people argue that by not doing more, you're actually making it harder to succeed here at home because mutations will develop and they will spread and come back here. So it's, it's an easy vision to sketch, tough policy to actually map. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I want to ask one more question about our allies, and then I, we do want, want do want to get to some specific questions about China and India. Um, in, in the book, in the the Empty Throne, you write uh, much. This is maybe the most optimistic way to um, to look at that problem that we've just been talking about. Much as oxygen goes unnoticed until it's gone, his refuse meeting President Trump's refusal to lead um, shows allies how much they had. In, invested in the international order and how essential American leadership was to maintaining that. Are there indications that that is happening? Has our absence at the, the leadership table made our allies' hearts grow fonder, or are they ready to just move on without us? Well, I think two things have happened at the same time. One, I think for many America's traditional friends, partners, and allies, the absence of American leadership made them realize that they needed to step up and they discovered they weren't able to do so. They weren't able to do so because they couldn't command others the way the United States could. Okay, and indeed one of the, one of the challenges the Biden administration has to deal with is that many of the political problems uh, that we see here in the United States today with concerns about the functioning or well-functioning of our government and of democracy can be seen in a number of our uh, partner countries, particularly in Europe. And obviously if countries are grappling with problems at home, it's hard to turn their attention to challenges overseas. I also think that what you've seen is many countries doing what countries do when uh, they're faced with uncertainty and that is they have hedged. And I do think many of our friends and allies have in some sense, uh, edged away from the United States, not necessarily moved on, uh, but are making sure that they have kept their options open. And I think one place where it's clear that uh, America's friends, partners, and allies have decided to go on without the United States is in the area of trade. 
what we have seen uh, is that everyone expected when President Trump withdrew the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, this big trade deal that would have if the United States had belonged to it, covered about 40% of the world's economic activity. The expectation was that TPP would just fall apart. Instead, countries like Japan and Canada worked very hard to make it into something else, now the CPTPP. Uh, and uh, there, the EU-Japan trade deal in a variety of other areas, we've seen countries go off and strike deals without the United States. And one of the consequences of that is that American manufacturers, American farmers, American ranchers are facing much more difficult uh, opportunities uh, overseas. They're getting to find themselves being shut out of markets. And I think this is one area in which the Biden administration really hasn't put forward a plan for how it intends to move on from the situation that the Trump administration left him. And I will note, again, I think President Biden's uh, mantra has been job one is to work on the economy, specifically to work on getting the uh, pandemic under control. And to some extent, we're going to put foreign policy on hold. There haven't been many new initiatives. But the problem is the rest of the world will move on. They're not necessarily going to wait till the United States is ready uh, to make some decisions. Makes sense. Let's let's talk about China. Uh, and I want to work in some questions from the audience. And, and to our audience, feel free to just go ahead and post questions in the Q&A, and I'll work those in as, as we have time. Uh, the president asked specifically about China, and he says, to what extent do you think trade with China and other geopolitical adversaries contributed to American geopolitical decline? Was this shift in power inevitable, or, did we simp or di are we simply reaping the consequences of helping hostile countries challenge us? It's a great question, and you could write books on it, and I promise you I'll give short answers, so I will try to do that. I, I would actually pull the aperture back and suggest that many of the problems we face today is because the foreign policy intuition of the generation that created the American-led order after World War II came true. In essence, what happened uh, when you go back to the generation of George Marshall, Dean Acheson, uh, Harry Truman, what they said to the world was, we want to build an order based on rules, transparency, give everybody a shot. We want people to become more democratic. If you do that, you will prosper. Guess what? We were right. That happened. And one of the inevitabilities of that was that as people who they became more powerful, power got distributed. And we shouldn't have some halcyon view that before 2016 or before 2000, there was this time where America commanded the world and could get other countries to do what it wants. Every president from Harry Truman up to Donald Trump uh, would write or talk about how difficult they found it trying to get allies and friends to do what we wanted them to do. But obviously over time, one of the things that happened was power got more and more uh, distributed at the same time, we became more interconnected, had more transnational problems, globalization picked up, and that meant that problems that started overseas didn't stay there. And we were never able to really adapt our institutions or our arrangements to be able to grapple with that. Now, obviously, one of the major consequences of American foreign policy uh, was the decision was China's rise, which was unquestionably helped by the United States commitment. It was a bipartisan commitment to engage in the policy known as strategic engagement. That is to open up or bring, try to bring China into uh, the system that the United States had created. The hope was to borrow the phrase that Bob Zellick uh, coined was that China would become a responsible stakeholder. Uh, it turned out at the end of the day the Chinese weren't interested in being a stakeholder in an American-led operation. Chinese clearly want to write the rules uh, in ways that favor themselves. And you can certainly go back and say, well, that was a mistake, but you always have to consider what the alternative was. Would a policy of having tried to exclude China from the international system worked well? 
And my guess is probably not. Fair enough. Let me ask about three things quickly related to China. Vaccines, um, human rights, and then trade, and particularly the tariffs. Uh, let me ask you about tariffs. You, you mentioned that, um, that you didn't feel like Biden has laid out a plan to sort of extricate us from, that, from the trade war. What should he do and how quickly should Biden rescind those tariffs? Uh, again, great question, very complex. Uh, let me note that in terms of trade policy, uh, there has been more continuity from the Trump administration to the Biden administration than change. Now, one of the questions uh, many people in Washington are asking and waiting to hear get answered is what will Joe Biden's trade policy look like? And we don't know. They said very little about it beyond talking about wanting to have a trade policy that works for workers. And uh, I think Catherine Tsai, who is the USTR person who heads up trade negotiations, has said that uh, that principle is our North Star. But there's not a lot of specifics in there to tell us where that is going to take us. I do think for the United States, it is, it, as it looks toward China, in trying to nudge China away from activities that we find threatening to our interests, the United States is going to have to engage in multilateral trade negotiations. It is going to have to find a way to get back to something like uh, TPP. It is going to have to try to revive something like uh, TTIP, which was the negotiations with Europe. It is going to have to find ways to sort of knit the economies of the world together uh, to create uh, a mass that can push back against China. Again, if you go back to TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the logic behind it wasn't just economic, find ways to make economies work more rationally, cut costs and the like. There was a strategic purpose. The idea is that if you were to engage in TPP, that would strengthen the economies of Pacific Rim countries. It would help them grow. It would create a set of rules that would become baked into the system that the Chinese would have to contend with. And as a result, the Chinese would feel tremendous pressure to adapt to that system. But instead of following through on that, we withdrew from the field of competition and the Chinese have basically been able to exert a lot more influence uh, than they would have otherwise. It's really hard to get stuff done if you don't show up and take a seat at the table. One of the ways that China has stepped in there and garnered uh, goodwill and influence is by distributing vaccines. China's pledged uh, roughly half a billion doses to 45 different countries. Should America play in that field? Should, should we be part of something like that? What, what should be our response there? Uh, the answer is yes, and, and we have the capacity to do so. I will note uh, that American vaccines or Western vaccines, since the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines uh, draw on uh, work done uh, outside the United States, that if you look at those vaccines, they're much more effective than the Chinese vaccine. And you I think particularly in Latin America where the Chinese vaccine has been widely distributed, there's great unhappiness uh, with its lack of effectiveness. So while the Chinese have uh, grabbed the headlines early on by being out there providing uh, vaccines, I don't think the impressions are fully baked in. I do think that the United States, because it initially did not want to participate in COVAX, it's like this international facility to distribute vaccines, uh, I think did hurt the United States uh, reputation. I think the Biden administration in trying to solve the domestic political problem of sort of being true to its word that it was gonna tackle COVID at home, created the opportunity to be criticized by China and other countries for not doing enough. I think that the Biden administration has to some extent turned the tables uh, with its decision uh, to agree to go through the WTO and lift the intellectual property rights protections for uh, vaccines. Uh, and of course, in doing so, it found itself running against one of uh, its other priorities in foreign policy, which is to work closely with our allies. We sort of sprung it on uh, the European Union and the British uh, who had backed us at the WTO at not lifting 
uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, but in, in that sense, when you talk about this as a public relations context, being seen as being on the right side of the issue, I think the Biden team has. One last thing I will say is that uh, as vaccine production ramps up in the United States, and actually in Western Europe as well, we're going to be able to put a lot of shots in a lot of arms around the world, and we're going to need to make sure that we actually do that. And it's going to be critical, not just a matter of humanitarian uh, purpose, that's very important, but also a matter of self-interest. And I think if uh, people have to understand that obviously, if the virus is allowed to run rampant in a country, you can get mutations that could potentially evade uh, the existing vaccines we have. So we have a vested interest in making sure that we can vaccinate as many people as possible. And that's going to be a tremendous logistical effort. Again, we think of the two vaccines that uh, are the most effective. They really require a special treatment, which isn't available in much of the rest of the world. Good. Before we get off of China, I want to ask about another uh, thing related to China and human rights and uh, human rights and religious freedom. I want to ask about what uh, about our response to what's happening with the Uyghurs in the Xinjiang region. Um, how how should President Biden, how should the U.S. F build a coalition to, to address what is what is essentially concentration camps in Northwest China? Well, doing the things that it has done. I think the Biden administration, and I will note that the prior administration, certainly Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, spoke a lot about uh, the situation of the Uyghurs. It is horrific. Uh, and I think the Biden administration has tried to enlist other countries uh, to, in essence, name and shame the Chinese. But here's the problem that the Biden administration faces. At the end of the day, we don't have tools that can compel the Chinese to change uh, their policies. We can try to embarrass them, raise the, in essence, public relations costs, uh, impair their soft power, but we don't have the tools to be able to compel the Chinese to stop the oppression, suppression uh, of the Uyghurs. Great. Uh, let's let, let's move to the, the Middle East, and I want to get to some again some questions from the audience. Um, uh, Deanne asks this: do the, do the Abraham Accords offer President Biden an opportunity to assume a leadership role with respect to the Middle East? If so, do you think he will take advantage of that? Uh, I think my shortest answer would be no and no. Now, I think when you look at the Abraham Accords, they're important. They weren't transformative. In many ways, they built on trends that had been going on for quite a while. There have been a fair amount of uh, cooperation among the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, and the Israelis, driven in good part because of concern about Iran's ambitions and Iran's behavior in the region. And there isn't an, a natural place for the uh, Biden administration to step in uh, in terms of the Abraham Accords. The real important player, I think, in the Abraham Accords going forward really is what does Saudi Arabia do? Because uh, that obviously would uh, have great importance given Saudi Arabia's uh, role in the Arab world and in the Islamic world. I also think that when you look at President Biden, again, going back to his uh, sort of fundamental principles, his objectives for his administration, what he was hoping to do was to have the United States be less committed, less involved in the Middle East, to shift attention, shift energy to address what he regards, I think rightly so, as America's main security and economic threat, that is the rise of China. Moreover, I think President Biden and his advisors looked at the Israeli-Palestinian problem in particular and saw very little possibility to make significant progress. So when you look at the Biden administration, we're now over the 100-day mark, maybe it's like the 125th day or so, uh, up until the turmoil uh, started going up in uh, Jerusalem in the last couple of days, essentially Israeli-Palestinian policy in the United States government uh, was handled by Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, uh, which is a pretty low-ranking person uh, in the State Department hierarchy, 
we did not have a special envoy name for uh, the Middle East the way we had, let's say, for uh, in previous administrations. You didn't see Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken making an early visit uh, to Israel to talk about reviving the peace talks. That's all changed given what's happening on the ground uh, now in, in Israel, uh, obviously with the uh, rocket attacks for coming from Gaza, uh, the potential that the Palestinian protests will grow, uh, I think has created a great deal of concern. The administration is now focused trying to uh, uh, find ways to potentially calm things down. But again, it's not clear that they have uh, very good tools in that regard. And I would note that it, it runs, uh, it creates sort of cross pressures for the Biden administration. Uh, on the one hand, the Biden administration wants to have reasonably good relations with the Israeli government because it wants to get back into the Iran nuclear deal and make it better. Uh, this is a position that at least uh, when um, Benjamin Netanyahu was prime minister of Israel uh, was a policy the Israelis didn't like. So that creates a problem. And also the Biden administration faces a split within its own democratic ranks up on Capitol Hill as to whether the United States should be supporting Israel uh, or pushing Israel uh, to change its policy toward the Palestinians. That was an issue throughout the democratic primaries. And I think if tensions continue, you're likely to see it come even more to the surface uh, back here in Washington. How would you rate Biden's decision to withdraw from Afghanistan and his execution there? Is, is that going to haunt him? Uh, it could. Uh, it could haunt him. Uh, obviously, much depends on what happens. I think if you look at the situation in Afghanistan, uh, the administration made the calculation that uh, 20 years was enough and it was time to come home and that it wasn't worth leaving behind a small uh, counterterrorism force as the then vice president, then candidate had actually suggested on the campaign trail. Now, it certainly ends the direct American involvement in the war in Afghanistan. It doesn't end uh, the war in Afghanistan that is going to continue. And here's where you'll get a debate among the experts. There are uh, those who argue that once the United States goes and the withdrawals are scheduled to be done by September 11th, that the Taliban will eventually come to power in Afghanistan and it will be very difficult to watch that the successes that we have seen in Afghanistan, particularly protections and opportunities for women and girls will be swept aside. And people have memories of the horrific barbaric way the Taliban governed when it was in power back in the early 1990s. You'll find other experts who argue that that's an overly pessimistic point of view, that Afghanistan has changed too much, that there are forces within the country uh, that will come to the force and fight the Taliban. Likewise, arguments uh, that uh, other countries see it in their interest to prevent the Taliban from coming to power, and perhaps a younger generation of Taliban, for a variety of reasons, uh, will not simply repeat the kinds of barbarities that they did in the early 1990s. So you can get experts to disagree about this. But obviously, you know, for President Biden, by removing troops, if things go bad or go badly, uh, obviously he's open to political criticism. And that's particularly so if you see some sort of terrorist operation being uh, guided or launched uh, out of Afghanistan. That's obviously would be politically very detrimental uh, to President Biden. Yeah. Let me shift for one question to India, and then we, we should do like a kind of a speed round with the uh, yep. audience questions. Um, Texas has, a I think, a growing and important relationship with India. There was just news out actually this week here locally about the number, the impressive number of South Asians that called North Texas home. Uh, COVID has as you know, been ravaging India. I think the last death toll, death toll that I saw was above um, a quarter million people, uh, even as the pandemic is, is waning here. So what is our obligation to help India and what might that response look like? Well, we've already seen a response, which is the administration 
is providing uh, raw materials needed to make vaccines and the like. It has taken the position uh, at the World Trade Organization, as I mentioned, about lifting uh, intellectual property protections on vaccines. This is a position that India and South Africa have been calling for for several months. I should note that uh, the situation India faces is partly because of decisions that the Indian government made. This is a government that back in February, just I guess short three months ago, passed a resolution congratulating itself for having defeated COVID-19. And one of the remarkable things about what the Modi government did was that it did not invest in vaccines. It did not stockpile things like oxygen. Uh, and that's critical, obviously, for people who become ill, but also because uh, India is one of the world's largest vaccine producers. It has tremendous capacity on this front. So while the United States can take steps, ultimately, for India to get a handle on COVID, it's going to require India and Indian government to be able to mobilize the resources within India. Uh, and again, it, as you, you've seen elsewhere, once the pandemic really begins to surge, it is hard uh, to contain it precisely because it is so easily transmittable. If we had um, three hours to quiz you, I'd, I'd ask you to compare Modi and Trump. I think that's fascinating comparison. Uh, both populist politicians, uh, both have very uh, effusive and committed followers, uh, both trying to change the direction of their country, both nationalists, uh, and both probably didn't take the uh, pandemic as serious as they should have and didn't take obvious steps that they should have. And I think uh, Prime Minister Modi, who again you know, won re-election, uh, by a large margin and really solidified uh, the hold of the BJP party has really, I think, reopened the political discussion in India because you are seeing uh, this surge strike across all income strata, all across the country, uh, raising real questions. I do think, you know, one of the challenges when we talk about U.S.-India relations, it's going to be a challenge for the Biden administration, given the amount of time they have talked about the importance of promoting democracy and try and reverse democratic recession or backsliding is that the Modi government clearly has been degrading uh, democratic rules uh, in India. And again, democracy is about more than just whether people get to vote. It's the conditions under which they get to vote. It's the rule of law, it's protection of minorities, freedom of speech, things like that. And they're all on a, 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 the wrong direction uh, in India. Great. Uh, I have 11 minutes left and we need to leave some time at the end. Let me just uh, do quickly uh, sort of some, some rapid fire questions here. Uh, this is going to be a hard one to answer quickly, but this is the first question. Robert, we're going to get to it. You're the first guy to ask a question, so I want to make sure we get it in here. He just says simply, is the U.S. overextended in its foreign policy? Uh, no. That was a good short question. <laughs> Would you have said no before uh, 2016? Yes, I, I would still say no. I mean, the United States, I'll just give you one uh, uh, statistic. If you look at defense spending as a share of GDP, it is lower now than it was during the Cold War. So it, the, our presence overseas is not a drain on the economy. It's not something uh, that can't be sustained. I think the bigger question for us as we look at our foreign policy is, are we investing in the right sorts of things, whether you're talking about defense or more importantly in diplomacy? We've underinvested in diplomacy uh, for a very long time. Great. Uh, Vina asks, how has the rise of nationalism and backlash to globalism around the world impacted U.S. interests? Well, big question. Lots of ways to answer it. I think one of the ways uh, populism and nationalism has made an impact is it makes it a lot harder to get cooperation with other countries because everyone takes sort of, uh, I'm going to protect my own approach. We're seeing it really hamper uh, efforts to deal with COVID-19. I'll also go back and say that it, nationalism was an issue that the, the greatest generation, Truman, Atchison, Marshall, and the rest 
really worried about because they had seen what nationalism did to the world. They had lived through World War I and then World War II. And a big part of the American-led international order was to try to find ways to tame nationalism precisely because it can be so powerful and it can prevent cooperation and fuel conflict. Uh, and so I think the rise of nationalism is, is a very real challenge. Great, this may be, this question may be the opposite side of that and you might've just sort of addressed it, but uh, someone asks, do we need to stop being the world's police? What will the outcome be pulling out of uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, hopefully not going into the new Israel, Israel-Palestine conflict. I guess the question is, do we need to stop being the world's police? Uh, well, I, I'm not a big fan of the, of the phrasing of, of world police, man. I think the question is better framed as, have we over-militarized our foreign policy? And the answer is yes. And I think that was one of the great mistakes coming out of uh, September 11th. The number of people uh, wrote at the time that was the great danger that we might find ourselves in, that we would, uh, in essence, turn to the military and ask them to do too much, and we did. I think the, uh, there's no way to describe it, that the invasion of Iraq was a, a major strategic mistake, kicking off a lot of problems that we're still dealing with. And again, I think it's important to understand that when you're talking about leadership and the importance of American leadership, it's not, leadership isn't about sending troops in to somebody else's country. Leadership is about mobilizing other countries to face common, challenges and to uh, address and seize common opportunities. And here's what's really interesting. We go back and read the essay I mentioned before by Henry Luce in Time Magazine, laying out the American century. He never talked about American power. He specifically said, we shouldn't attempt to be the world's policeman, but through the power of our example, through the power of our economy, the power of our technology, the power of our agriculture, we could change the world. And he was right in that, and we can still do it. You, you brought up leadership, and I, I want to squeeze this in if I can, because I had a question about that. I thought you had an interesting, uh, another quote from your book. You wrote that uh, Trump was comfortable advocating American leadership because he saw no value in it, just costs. In his view, America neither had exceptional responsibilities nor was an exceptional country. Rather, it was like every other nation, and as, as a result, it should pursue its own narrow interests, not mutual ones. I actually wanted to maybe challenge you a little bit on that because I'm not sure Trump saw um, other country countries as equals. I, I'm not sure. I think he might have been too proud to admit equals. Uh, but what he showed was a definition of leadership that equates leading to winning. And so uh, the player with the most chips is the leader. So the goal is to get the most chips. Um, how should our definition of global leadership be different than winning? I think you started to, to sort of answer that just now. Well, I think you're quite right. And I think you, know, you referenced in the book I wrote with Ambassador Dalder, uh, we write that Donald Trump saw international politics uh, really as a competition and he wanted to be a winner and not a loser. And he thought that because the United States was more powerful than other countries, it would by definition get its way. And that gave us among other things, the trade war with China uh, which ended up hurting a lot of American uh, farmers and exporters. So I don't disagree with you in terms of how Donald Trump saw uh, the importance of winning. I think that if you go back to, again to thinking of Marshall and Truman uh, and Atchison and sort of the world they created, it was sort of continued by Eisenhower and Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, uh, the notion was one we could, I guess, describe as enlightened self-interest, that if you took sort of Donald Trump's very narrow transactional view of the world, you would end up being less well off than if you took a more, a broader perspective on your interests, what we like to call enlightened self-interest. And again, think about it. After the end of World War II, the United States made the decision that it was going to help Europe rebuild, right? We had the Marshall Plan. And we did it not as a charity case because we you know, wanted to help these poor people. That was also a, a motive. But we did it in good part because of self-interest. We believed that if we helped them rebuild, we could create a world that would be more secure and prosperous for them, but also more secure and prosperous for ourselves. And I would argue that if you do a sort of a fair credit and debit 
accounting of the past 75 years. Uh, the side uh, on the sort of the credit or the pluses is a lot more than on what's on the side of the debit. I think the problem was is that President Trump just always focused on the costs and never really on the benefits, despite the fact that he had advisors, certainly during his first two years, who kept trying to drive that message home time and again, they got nowhere. Great. Two more quick uh, audience questions, and then um, and then we need to wrap up. Is is China's widespread Belt and Road Pro Initiative likely to expand China's influence at the expense of the U.S.? Yes, and it's also going to create real challenges trying to deal with climate change because, among other things, the Belt and Road Initiative you know, that the Chinese are pushing is financing what looks to be several hundred coal fire plants uh, throughout uh, Central Asia and elsewhere, and that is just going to swamp us with even more heat trapping gases. So I think the Belt and Road Initiative uh, is a problem in climate change, not simply in terms of uh, what it does for uh, China's yeah. influence. Great but there's a downside here quickly. Downside would be part of the problem when the Chinese come in is they dominate local economies. Uh, they have a bad habit of fueling corruption, uh, which tends to alienate the publics in many of the countries they do business. Great point. We, did, we didn't even have a chance to talk about um, about climate change, but we're, we are out of time. Let me just uh, end it there and say thank you so much, Dr. Lindsay. Um, I felt, I enjoyed the conversation, even though I felt like I was just peppering you. And uh, I think it's been really helpful, really enlightening. I want to introduce um, Ray Timoney, who um, is going to wrap things up for us. So thanks again. Okay. Thank, thank you. Brian. On behalf of the International Perspective Series, I'd like to thank you, Jim, for dedicating your time to speak to us today, and to you, Ryan, for your insightful questions that made up the discussion with Jim so engaging. I'm Ray Termini with the International Perspective Series. As you may know, IPS was founded over 20 years ago by Mel Hewson and became a collaborative effort between the DFW World Affairs Council and the Dallas American Jewish, Jewish Committee. IPS has been fortunate over the years to bring many excellent speakers to you. And when one of these speakers combines a strong background in the subject, as well as an exciting way of explaining the topic, we invite him or her back. In 2018, Jim spoke to us on American influence, the cost of American nationalism. As we all know, the perception of the United States has changed since Jim last spoke to us. In his earlier address, Jim explained to us the cost that American nationalism would have on the influence of the United States in the world. We were indeed fortunate today to have Jim share with us his insight on how these costs have been and are continuing to be paid. Again, I'd like to thank the World Affairs Council and AJC Dallas for making IPS so successful and the international law firm of Haynes and Boone for its general financial support. Thank you and have a good evening.